we begin our discussion of formal logic using Barwise, Echemende, and Plummer's Language Proof and Logic with Chapter 1. So here the focus is on the um, smallest units of our artificial language, um, or the building blocks, if you will. So in this video, we will cover um, Chapter 1, Sections 1, 2, 3, and 4. Before we move on to Chapter 2, which covers the basics of inferences. More specifically, we will there cover um, how we can know that an inference is logically correct or not. But here we begin with chapter one. So first off, um, what we want to think about when we're thinking about the building blocks of this new artificial language is how this artificial language is going to help us to see the logical structure of our ordinary language. And um, there are various versions of the notation that one can use in our version of the deductive system we're studying, uh, but our authors have uh, chosen what you will see in just a moment. Um, but let's look at the technical terminology. Um, we've got individual constants, and that is simply the fancy pants name for the, or terminology, I should say, the term for um, individually named entities. So you can see in this slide that there are photos of several adorable um, puppies and kitties. We have, um, in order of the photos from left to right, Brett Michaels. We have uh, Joe Doggy and Ella McPunks a lot. We have Stuart, Stuffy Chunks Thompson. The kitty at the top on the far right is Aloysius Ferdinand. And Horatio H. Kane is the puppy all um, uh, cuddled up in his blanket on the sofa. Um, so named entities, and here I've chosen dogs and cats, but anything that we can um, uh, identify by a name, a person, place, time, or thing, is called an individual constant. In our system, individual constants are all written out in lowercase. So for example, the name Flanny, the name Al, the name H, the name Stuffs, and so forth. Individual constants refer to exactly one object. I know that, uh, for example, there are a lot of other people in the world named Mia besides me, but in first order logic, the individual constant Mia will have one and only one referent. Now, this is um, an important point to remember as we understand eventually the concept of the indiscernibility of identicals, um, but the point here is that uh, if in this version of the system we're learning, we know that you cannot have two or more objects with the same name. What we're really doing is, uh, by this rule, is reflecting the idea that even if it were the case that there were multiple objects with the same name, that doesn't mean that those objects are one and the same object, right? So even though there may be multiple Mias in the universe, there is one and only one me, uh, this particular object that we're calling Mia. So for us, um, the Tursky's World program is really helpful in making sense of this. Um, it does not let you give uh, two objects the same name. Let me show you. So here's a screenshot of um, uh, just the um, world pane in Tarski's world. And you'll see that there are two objects. There's a dough deck and a cube. The dough deck is named A. Now, when I click on the cube, that large green object, look at the uh, letter A that I've circled in red. It's grayed out. It can't be chosen. And so what Tarski's world does is to force us um, not to... Uh, make the mistake of thinking that two objects that are in fact different are the same, right? So you and I know just by looking at the dodec and the cube that they're two different objects. But 
if you give them the same name and you don't give them any other distinguishing marks to help us understand that they're not the same object, we could conflate them. Okay, so um, it's important to know then that individual constants are names of entities. They're specifically named things. And in our system, you are not going to uh, be able to name any object. Sorry, let me rephrase that. You're not going to be able to name two or more objects uh, the same. So that said, one object can have multiple names or no names at all. So here again is a screenshot. I've added a few names, um, or sorry, I've added two names to the doe deck I originally named A. And you'll see that that doe deck is now A, B, and C. Um, I could name that object all six possible names, right? But I've just chosen those. So um, one object can have multiple names, but two or more objects cannot share the same name. Now, I know there's a lot of stuff on the slide, um, but bear with me, I'll, I'll go through it, I hope fairly efficiently. Um, what we wanna think about next is the other part of our building blocks sentences. So um, a sentence, as we know, that is singular, is a sentence that, is, um, that involves a named entity. What we say about the named entity is what is predicated of that entity. So let's take a, a look at the following example. examples. Stuffy loves H, right? Stuffy is the grammatical subject and loving H is the grammatical predicate. More specifically though, because H is a named entity, loves is the relational predicate between them. So the grammatical subject is not the same as the logical subject. Anytime you see a name in a, uh, a, a sentence in our first order logic, you know that that's an individual constant and it is uh, notated with, in, with lowercase uh, language, lowercase letters. And those lowercase letters uh, appear in a parentheses. The predicate, in this case, the relational predicate loves, it comes in front of or to the left of the individual constants. In this case, there are two. And the first letter of the word loves is capitalized. So um, let's drop your eyeballs all the way down and you see loves, open paren, stuffy, comma, H, close paren. That's the um, way that we will notate our simple or atomic sentences. So let's now take a look at the second bullet point. A predicate symbol expresses a relation or property of objects. So um, we've got an object and that object uh, can have a name. It can have multiple names. It cannot share a name with any other object. And that object um, has a property or properties that we ascribe to it. That object also bears relationships to other objects. So the predicate symbol uh, then takes a fixed number of arguments or arity. Basically, um, the, the individual constants, since we're talking about the level of a singular uh, statement. So we end up with a capital letter that begins the predicate that we use. Then we have however many individual constants we're talking about in the sentence. If there are multiple constants, they are separated by commas. And the constant or constants uh, are always in parentheses. So the sentence al is between stuffy and h becomes between open parenthesis a comma s comma h. Now I've used just three letters. In our version of the system, we will always write out the name in full. I just use a, s, and h because I'm toggling a little bit between the single letters that we get in Tarski's world. There are six of them in total, and those letters are the individual constants that were allowed in that um, program. 
but it's also the case that there are other times when we uh, write out names um, in full, and what I mean by that is something like Stuffy or Stewart, that sort of thing. Okay, so what do individual constants and predicates give us? Well, in terms of the smallest linguistic unit that is true or false, we've got an atomic sentence. An atomic or simple sentence is a sentence that doesn't have or uh, involve a connective, more on connectives in chapter three. That's maybe the easiest way to talk about an atomic sentence. Another way to say that, uh, or another way to talk about the atomic sentence is to say that it is uh, the, the smallest linguistic unit that is either true or false. So for example, um, you can have a sentence with lots of words because maybe you have dependent clauses um, and still have an atomic or simple sentence. The sentence Barack Obama is the 44th president of the United States is a simple sentence even though it contains a lot of words. The, this, the following sentence is also uh, an atomic sentence. Stewie sits, subject, verb. That's sort of numerically the, the, the smallest uh, uh, sentence with a truth value. So when we have an atomic sentence, we have uh, one or more individual constants and we have a predicate. Now, just as a quick reminder, the order of names is important when we're dealing with multiple individual constants. Take the example, Stuffy loves H. Uh, loves is not uh, necessarily a transitive verb, right? Um, it does happen to be the case that Stuffy and H love each other, but that sentence, Stuffy and H love each other, is compound. At the level of the atomic sentence, we only know when we say Stuffy loves H that the love relationship goes from Stuffy toward H. We don't know anything about H's love of Stuffy, right? On the other hand, if I state discreetly, Stuffy loves H, full stop, another sentence, H loves Stuffy, full stop, we get loves, open parentheses, Stuffy, comma, H, close parentheses, and loves, open parentheses, H, comma, Stuffy, close parentheses, where L in loves is capitalized, H, or sorry, S and H are lowercase. So um, as it's probably clear right now, uh, Tarski's world gives us a predefined language and it's really, really helpful to us when um, we might begin to, to feel a little bit overwhelmed by um, how many um, possible sentences are out there in ordinary language and we might feel like it's just too much to, to think about. But if you think about restricting yourself to what Tarski's world allows, we have um, a total of three objects, we have a total of three sizes, and a total of three names, and then a bunch of relations that they can bear to each other. And, and so it really, it sort of, in a very positive way, um, makes our world very, very small. Right? So that's very helpful. Once we're comfortable with how we build atomic sentences and how we can understand by way of a correspondence theory of truth whether or not a sentence in Tarski's world is true or false, it'll be easier to leave that world and, and make other sentences. So um, if you are uh, working on a non-Tarski's world sentence, you'll want to follow um, a uh, basically the parameters of uh, Barwise Etchemendi and Barker Plummer's uh, scheme here where you have um, a predicate, the first letter of which is capitalized, then you have an open parenthesis, then you have an individual constant and a closed parenthesis, or if you have multiple individual constants because you're dealing with a relational predicate, then you will have a comma in between uh, each of your individual constants. All right, so let's go ahead and practice. Stuffy is happy. Stuffy is the grammatical and logical subject. Happy is the grammatical and logical predicate. 
What do we know about uh, individual, or sorry, what do we know about uh, logical subjects? They are called individual constants. They appear in parentheses to the right of the predicate, all lowercase, and the predicate appears to the left of the individual constant in its par parenthetical, and the first letter of the predicate is capitalized. So we have happy stuffy. H loves stuffy. Brett is in front of Al. And here you might want to consult Tarski's world so you can see how they deal with the predicate, uh, uh, the phrase rather, in front of. You can see that they use front of. So if you um, don't type in uh, or the, sorry, if you don't type in exactly the predicate in the uh, notation that they use, Tarski's world won't understand what you're doing. You can also use the buttons, which will um, not only solve that problem for you, but will give you the predefined fields. Um, I'll show you that in just a moment. And then lastly, Joe is to the left of H. Left of is the predicate. Notice the order. Brett is the one in front of Al. Brett goes first. Joe is to the left of H. H goes first. So let me show you real quick um, what I mean by uh, the pre-given fields when you use the buttons in Tarski's world. If you want uh, um, more than what I'm about to give you, I have uh, basic uh, uh, tutorials on using uh, the Tarski's world program. Okay, so we've got the world pane, we've got the sentences pane. Um, let me show you what I mean when I talk about how Tarski's world can help us make sure that we write sentences that conform to the requirements of the notation that we're using. So I'll go ahead and make a couple of, or uh, create a world, bring in a couple of objects. Uh, I'll go ahead and name the dodec uh, B. Now, if I want to type in the sentence dodec B, I can do that. And by the way, as I'm typing, watch what happens when I create the parentheses. Notice that I'm being told by the program by way of those green highlights that I have successfully created the parentheses around the individual constant, the name B. Um, it, the, you might not think that's a big deal, and in a sense it's not, but when the sentences get really complicated later on, it's easy to kind of lose where your parentheses are. You can, get an, you can fail to close a paren, in other words. Um, so, so I can type in no problem, but notice the mistake that I've made. I've got dodec with a lowercase b. So when I go to check whether or not my sentence corresponds to this world, I click verify, I get an asterisk, and that asterisk is telling me um, that there's something wrong with the way I've written the sentence. On the other hand, if I use the buttons, right, so notice all of these buttons, there are other um, buttons we can look at, but that will come a little bit later. Uh, but let's just focus on what's what always shows up when you open the program. On the other hand, if I use the button dodec, automatically I've got a sentence that is um, uh, on the way to completely correct. In other words, the predicate is written out in the notation that uh, is required and my parentheses are set up. I can then go over to this uh, uh, set of buttons where I've got, for our purposes, all that we need right now. Let's not worry about the other buttons. We've got um, our individual constants and we've got parentheses. So I don't need to use parentheses, they've been pre-given. Since the green within the parentheses in the sentence file uh, is highlighted, it means I just click on B and I'm good to go. So then when I hit verify, the sentence comes out true. Okay, I hope that this um, brief tutorial helps you get started on chapter one of Barwise, Echemende, and Barker Plumber's Language Proof and Logic.